dangerous climate change has arrived and it's a matter at this point of how bad we're willing to let it get and, and we cannot allow the warming to exceed that one and a half celsius um, and we're at about 1.2 so that gives you an idea of how little wiggle room there is Aloha and welcome to this conversation sponsored by the Hawaii Book and Music Festival and the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. This series is a joint venture of UH, the Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. Today's program is also in partnership with the State of Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission. And there have been a series of climate related talks in lead up to next month's UN Climate Summit, COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. I'm McKenna Kaufman. I'm a professor of urban and regional planning at UH Manoa as well as the director for the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. I'm really pleased to introduce our distinguished guest today, world-renowned climate scientist, Mike Mann, who is calling in from State College, Pennsylvania. Mike is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and the director of the Earth System Science Center at Pennsylvania State University. He was elected to the National Academies of Science in 2020, and has been a long contributor to our scientific understandings of human-induced climate change, within the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Process. Mike was the lead author two decades ago on the IPCC third assessment report that first published what has become known as the hockey stick curve, projecting human activities impacts on Earth's temperatures. As a climate scientist, Mike has long been engaged in US policy debates about climate action and has a new book out entitled The New Climate War. And you can see it on Mike's bookshelf back there. Um, just as a reminder to our audience, please be sure to send in your questions, and I hope to weave them in in our conversation, and so you can put them into the Q&A. Mike, thank you so much for being here with me today. Now, thank you, McKenna. It's great to be with you. Uh, you know, I often say at these virtual events that I, I wish I could be there in person, but I really do mean I wish I could be there in person. Of course, Hawaii is one of my favorite places to, to be, and uh, I'm sorry I can't be there uh, in person one of these days, um, hopefully. Uh, we, we will be able to do that, but it's great to be part of this event virtually here today. Yeah, we're really happy to be able to call in. And when you are here in person, we, we can meet and get coffee and <laughs> actually uh, talk in person, which would be wonderful to do again. So I want to start uh, this with just giving our audience a, a sense of the current climate science. Uh, and, you know, you recently published uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy, a scientific retrospective, if you will, on what is further known and what you know, uh, is yet to be explained in regards to the seminal work on the hockey stick. And can you just briefly explain this for our audience? You know, some, what were some of your most important takeaways from, from working on that piece? Yeah, so, you know, uh, more than two decades ago, as you alluded to, we uh, published the, the first uh, version of the so-called hockey stick curve. It was a reconstruction of how temperatures had varied as far back as we could go, which was um, a, a thousand years. And what it showed was that the warming of the past century that coincides with the Industrial Revolution is unprecedented uh, as far back as we could go. It's the blade of what looks like a hockey stick. Uh, the, the handle is sort of the relatively flat preceding 900 years, and then the abrupt warming of the last 100 years is the blade. And unfortunately, in those 20 years, uh, the blade has gotten sharper and longer because the planet has continued to warm up and we haven't seen the, the sort of action that we really need to see. Um, and of course, uh, we're at a moment right now uh, in the lead up to the Glasgow uh, COP26 fest, uh, uh, conference, um, the, the, the climate uh, UN Climate Summit in, in Glasgow, which may be our last opportunity to agree to reductions in carbon emissions that will keep the planet below a truly dangerous one and a half degree Celsius, uh, roughly three degree Fahrenheit. And so this all comes together. The, the hockey stick has gotten sharper, but we can prevent it from getting ever longer and sharper if we take the sort of action that we need to. And, and of course, we are now seeing the impacts of climate change play out in real time. They're no longer subtle in the way that they were 20 years ago. We're seeing the impacts in the form of uh, devastating heat waves and droughts and wildfires and floods and, and coral bleaching um, and, and many of the impacts that you're seeing there in, in Hawaii. Um, this has become very real and this is an important moment. Bring in terms of these these you know Im these climate change impacts that we're experiencing and you know now in the current these are no longer future events 
Um, and one of the, you know, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report recently came out. And one of the really, you know, stark statements, I think for people who are climate scientists is not stark, but for the, the general public, that it's unequivocal, right? That human influence is warming the atmosphere, the ocean and the land. To me, the report sort of gives this really strong message. The science of attribution has gotten far better as well as it makes this point that, you know, there's still time to act. We can, we can do this. And this really also mirrors the argument in, in your book, uh, the, the New Climate War. Can you talk about sort of the levels of greenhouse gas emissions reductions that need to reach, let's say the two degrees of warming, but actually the increasingly important uh, 1.5 degrees of warming. And it also, you, in your book, you talk about the concept of a carbon budget. Can you explain that for our audience and what does that mean in terms of you know the levels of greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah, I'll provide a little bit of additional perspective because back in I believe it was 2007 after the IPCC had award uh, been awarded co-awarded the Nobel uh, Peace Prize with Al Gore, um, there was a big IPCC meeting at the University of Hawaii Manoa um, uh, campus and I came and a lot of uh, the scientists came. I should say co-awarded with you included, our audience should know that. So, yeah. I was one of hundreds of scientists absolutely who contributed to, to that effort and we were there to collectively I suppose celebrate, but it was sort of a pyrrhic um, victory that we were celebrating because, of course, um, little did we know that, you know, back in 2007, it would be 14 years later and the message still hadn't been heard to the extent that it needed to be. And so now we do need to see a much steeper decline in carbon emissions. If we had acted when we first knew we had a problem decades ago, it would have been relatively easy to gently bring down our carbon emissions. We could sort of very steadily and deliberately move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. Now we've got to do this much more quickly we basically have to accomplish this transition in about 10 years. We have to bring carbon emissions down by 50% within this decade and down to zero um, by mid-century if we are to have any hope of keeping warming below that dangerous one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, and I'll just say, you know, dangerous climate change has actually arrived. If you're California, um, the Western United States with the wildfires um, that they've seen, or Australia, where I did a sabbatical a couple of years ago uh, during what came to be known as the, the, the Black Summer, you know, uh, bushfires that blanketed the continent. If you're Puerto Rico, uh, Caribbean islands that have been decimated by storms. If you're my state of Pennsylvania that was flooded, um, Philadelphia was drenched uh, by the, the moisture, the remaining rainfall from this uh, Hurricane Ida that came through just a, a month or so ago. So dangerous climate change has arrived and it's a matter at this point of how bad we're willing to let it get. And, and we cannot allow the warming to exceed that one and a half Celsius. Um, and we're at about 1.2. So that gives you an idea of how little wiggle room there is. We're at 1.2, if we're gonna prevent you know, the global thermometer from crossing that one and a half degrees Celsius warming. Well, again, we have to see dramatic action over the next decade and, and you know, next month in, in uh, Glasgow, we need to see far bolder commitments than we've yet seen from the countries of the world. Maybe, maybe it was in this meeting post 2007, but you, you've made this transition from sort of hard climate scientists to also being um, an, an advocate for policy, right? And, you know, your new book has, you know, a lot of the science, but it's mainly about the discourse. Can you explain how you made that transition from scientist to the role of the policy advocate? Yeah, thanks. You know, uh, decades ago when I double majored in applied math and, and physics at UC Berkeley, I didn't think I was setting myself up for a career you know, uh, at the center of one of the most contentious societal debates that we've ever had, if not the most contentious debate that we've ever had. But it's where my work ultimately led me when we published the hockey stick curve back um, in 1998 and then uh, elongated version in 1999, whether I realized it at the time or not, I had put myself at the center of the political debate because the hockey stick really represented a threat to some of the powerful vested interests, the forces of inaction, I call them in the book, or inactivists, fossil fuel 
companies, um, conservative media outlets and politicians that advocate uh, for them um, and have collectively done everything they can to block the effort to to decarbonize our civilization. Um, The hockey stick was a threat to that very powerful lobby because it told a simple story. Um, it, it, It laid bare the profound impact that we're having on this planet. And as a result of that, um, it became uh, the center of attacks by climate change contrarians and climate change deniers. And I found myself at the center of those attacks. So, you know, I, I sometimes say that I didn't come to politics, politics came to me. Um, it's, it's not what I signed up for, but over time uh, I came to embrace this role, this initially reluctant role that I was playing in the larger conversation about climate change. Because while it isn't, you know, what I envisioned I'd be doing with my life, uh, frankly, I love doing science. I love solving problems, analyzing data, constructing models. This is the the stuff that got me interested in science and in climate science in the first place. But I found myself in a position to influence the conversation about the greatest challenge that we've ever faced as a civilization. And I've come to really embrace that role. And so, you know, over the last um, decade uh, and a half, perhaps, um, increasingly, um, much of what I spend my time doing, I still do the science. It's important to me to continue to contribute to our scientific understanding of the climate crisis and its impacts. But it's also very important to me to try to communicate that to the public and policymakers. And it, it, it is something that I've, you know, come to, um, to, to enjoy doing. And, and this is an extension of it right here. Great. I want to lean into what you're talking about in terms of the, the massive pushback from the fossil fuel industry. And one of the, the major points of your book was, you know, there was this long time deflection campaign by fossil fuel interest groups. And one of the strategies was really to put an emphasis on individual action, right? The importance of eating meat or eating less meat, I need to say, eating less meat, flying less, right? The things that an individual can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And rather than systemic policy level action, you know, and actually the, the personal carbon footprint as an idea is an, is an example of this, yeah. right? Can you uh, talk a little bit about this? You know, how do you see this tension between individual versus systemic policy action playing out in today's climate dialogue? Yeah, so no, you're absolutely right. As you know, we were talking about before, the impacts of climate change have become clear um, to the person on the street. And so the inactivists, the forces of inaction can no longer deny that climate change is happening. They can't credibly deny that anymore. So they've moved on to these other tactics. And in many cases, these, these tactics are even more insidious um, than outright denial uh, because they're sort of harder to see. They're harder to ferret out. Um, they have a veneer of credibility to them. After all, we should of course all do everything that we can to minimize our environmental impact and our carbon footprint. Um, and many of the things that we do to do that make us healthier, they save us money, they make us feel better about ourselves, Uh, they set a good example for other people. And so, of course, we should do those things. But what the inactivists have done is they've used that as a wedge. They've used that individual action as a way to get us arguing with each other about our individual carbon footprints, um, because it it plays into another tactic. Um, It's deflection, deflecting attention away from the needed systemic solutions, policies, towards individual action, but it also plays to their tactic of division. It gets us fighting with each other over, you know, whether you're, we're vegans or not, whether we fly or not, whether we, we've chosen to have children or not, um, uh, carbon shaming, finger pointing, um, a divisive behavior that divides the community. Um, and so it no longer uh, speaks with a, you know, a single commanding voice demanding action. Uh, this tactic um, has its roots um, uh, decades ago, for example, in what has come to be known as the crying Indian uh, ad, uh, Native American uh, uh, who was featured in this ad that I remember when I was growing up, it played in the early 1970s, and it was this tearful um, Native American. It turns out uh, the actor who played the the, the Indian uh, wasn't even a Native American. Um, he was an Italian American, and that was the least of the subterfuge that was behind that commercial because 
while it felt empowering, it was telling us that we needed to clean up um, the bottle and can litter that had been strewn in our countryside. And, and it played upon sort of the power of our indigenous people, um, this idea that um, we were committing an offense against our, you know, um, uh, the Native Americans, the indigenous people by destroying this home, uh, this, this land. And it put forward this idea that we just all needed to be better stewards of the environment and, and pick up uh, these bottles and cans. What we didn't realize at the time was that it was actually a PR campaign that had been um, secretly hatched by the beverage industry, by Coca-Cola and Anheuser-Busch. They didn't want bottle bills passing in the various states. This was a regulatory solution. We put a, a, a deposit on bottles and cans, uh, so we'd return them. Um, they would be processed, recycled. Uh, it would solve the problem, but it would hurt their bottom line. It would hurt their profits because they would be responsible for processing those returned bottles and cans. And so instead, they chose to spend millions of dollars in this massive deflection campaign to convince us that we didn't need systemic solutions. We didn't need bottle bills. And it was successful. Um, uh, and there's no national bottle bill. There are only, I think, 13 states now that have bottle bills. So they were successful in that deflection campaign. And as a result, we have one of our other global environmental crises, the, the global plastic pollution crisis. We can thank in part to the success of industry with that deflection campaign. And so they took that playbook um, and they've been running with it when it comes to uh, climate change. And as you alluded to, the very notion of a carbon footprint, an individual carbon footprint was popularized by none other than British Petroleum back in the early 2000s, because British Petroleum wanted us so focused on our own individual carbon footprint that we failed to notice theirs. A hundred companies, fossil fuel companies are responsible for 70% of the carbon pollution. So yes, let's do everything we can as individuals to be better stewards of our environment, but let's not let them off the hook by pretending that individual lack, uh, action alone is going to solve the problem because you and I can't put a price on carbon. We can't impose subsidies on renewable energy. We can't uh, block new fossil fuel infrastructure. These are all things that we need our politicians to do, and we need them representing us rather than being rubber stamps for polluters. Uh, pushing on that a little bit, the Green New Deal is something you know people hear a lot about. It's, you know, a, a set of buzzwords, and it's spearheaded by a very charismatic, you know, new leaders like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, I'm wondering if you can share some of your thoughts about the Green New Deal, you know, what it actually is or might be. Um, what do you think about it? So, yeah, I'm a big fan of AOC's. She's done uh, so much to sort of to, to popularize um, and raise awareness about the, the need to uh, address the climate crisis. In, in the book, um, what I argue is um, there's some versions of, of the Green New Deal that, in my view, have become too narrow. Um, for example, there's been a movement away from the idea of carbon pricing. And I think carbon pricing is a very important tool. And we're going to need sort of all of those, the tools in the toolbox if we're really going to address this problem. Uh, I don't think we can you know, take uh, carbon pricing, for example, off the table. But um, among some progressives, uh, there is this notion that carbon pricing would somehow uh, hurt uh, the poor, it would hurt uh, frontline communities, but that's not the way it's played out in countries that have successfully implemented it, like Australia, until the conservative government came in and got rid of it, and it had been reducing carbon emissions, and it was actually uh, leading to increased income for uh, low income, uh, low, low earning uh, families and individuals, because the revenue that was raised from this emissions trading uh, scheme, uh, it was called, was returned preferentially to low income uh, earners in frontline communities. And so there are ways to, uh, you know, to, to do carbon pricing um, so that it ends up being uh, implemented in a, in a progressive fashion. And it doesn't hurt um, those, you know, the frontline communities, uh, the low income earner, earners most impacted and most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So it's really important that carbon pricing be done in a way that respects issues of social justice and climate justice. And it can be, we shouldn't throw it out because some have come to believe that it's inconsistent with, with 
with climate justice. If done properly, it is. And it just, you know, it's one of the tools that we need to use. So, you know, there are some aspects of the Green New Deal that I think, um, you know, have too narrow a, a view of what sort of instruments uh, we need to use in addressing the climate crisis. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the other point that I made in the book was that something that appears to be associated with a, a very sort of expansive social agenda is unlike, and this was, you know, more than a year ago when I, I wrote the book, it was actually the August before the last presidential election when the book went to press. And at the time, it seemed uh, likely to me that we would see a, a Democratic president which came to fruition, but that we would have a closely divided Congress and not enough of a democratic majority to pass expansive climate legislation. And that's what we're seeing now. In fact, we're seeing with this reconciliation bill that we don't even have 50 Democrats right now to pass you know, an expansive bill that would address a whole bunch of things, in, including uh, you know, including climate. And so um, in the end, we may have to be a little bit more strategic in how we advance climate policy right now with the hope and expectation that maybe two, four, six years down the road, there will be a mandate for, for more expansive, um, you know, a more expansive program. But we sort of have to take what we can get now because there just isn't any time to lose if we're going to address the crisis. Can you explain for our audience sort of what you see as the, the glimmers of hope on climate action within the reconciliation bill, um, all, also the infrastructure bills? You know, now that as you said you, you didn't know the outcome of the election when you wrote this book, now that the Biden administration has been in for not quite a year, um, you know, what do you think has been accomplished and, you know, could potentially be accomplished? Yeah. So, you know, remarkably, things have sort of played out in the way that we, uh, you know, I, I envisioned they would, um, where you know we have a president who supports aggressive action on climate, and I believe that to be true of, of Biden at the time. A, a lot of folks were were skeptical, but then he came in and he really did put forward the boldest set of executive actions we've ever seen any incoming president put forward on climate. Um, a more aggressive agenda on climate, for example, than Barack Obama, and so I think he surprised a lot of the critics. And, and the Biden administration has also engaged the international community, which is really important. The United States, by demonstrating leadership, is bringing other, you know, intransigent actors to the table. Uh, China is back at the negotiating table now. We've seen bold commitments from the EU, from uh, the UK. Um, so there's a lot of progress being made simply because the United States is now in a position of leadership and and diplomatic engagement with other countries to, to bring them along as well. And, and that's monument, you know, of monumental importance. But there's only so much you can do through executive action alone. If we are to make good on the commitment that the Biden administration has made to bring our carbon emissions in the United States down by 50% within the decade, that's their commitment. And it's consistent with the, the action that we need to see globally to avert catastrophic warming. If they're to make good on that, they're going to need that to be backed up legislatively. We're going to need climate legislation that codifies um, those commitments. And one thing that I do like, um, the, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill doesn't do a whole lot on climate. Uh, most of the real climate action is in this, uh, in this reconciliation package that is still in limbo right now as we seek to get some clarity from the two holdouts, the two Democratic holdouts, uh, Mansion of West Virginia and Cinema of Arizona. But it has one of the things that's really important, um, and there are incentives for electric vehicles um, to help us decarbon, decarbonize the, the trans transportation sector, but the electricity, the power generation sector is critical. And there's something known as a clean energy standard, uh, or sometimes called a clean energy portfolio standard that's in the current version of that package, which would require utilities to provide up to 80% of their energy from renewables by uh, the end of this decade and 100% by 2035. It's sort of an alternative uh, vehicle to carbon pricing. Um, it, it's another way of trying to incentivize the you know, energy producers to, to move in the direction that we need to see them move. So it's a market 
mechanism. Um, and it seems to have more support right now than some of the other market mechanisms like say carbon pricing. And as I said before, we've got to take what we can get. And so I am hopeful that those climate you know, provisions in the reconciliation package stay there because there's going to be pressure by, you know, probably by one of those, uh, you know, red state Democrats to try to strip down some of those climate measures, particularly the, um, the, the clean energy standard. And it needs to stay because without that, it's very difficult to see how the United States keeps its commitment. And if we don't keep our commitment, then we suddenly uh, lose the sort of diplomatic impact that 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 we've had um, recently. Hawaii actually ha is one, among the 30 states that have a renewable portfolio standard, very similar yeah. to an energy standard. Um, ours mandates 100% of net electricity sales be from renewable energy by 2045. So it would be very interesting to see a national standard that supersedes many of the state efforts. Yeah, no, and the, you're absolutely right. Part of why there's reason for optimism is even in the absence of sort of national standards, we've seen a lot of leadership States like Hawaii, the West Coast states, um, uh, the, the New England and Mid-Atlantic states have formed this consortium, REGI, uh, which Pennsylvania is now part of. So roughly 30% of our country, 30% um, of our population is in a state that does have some sort of uh, climate uh, policy right now. But of course, we need 100% of the population to be in a country, the United States, that has meaningful climate policy. Yeah, I want to loop back around to uh, carbon pricing. So, you know, you've, you've advocated for carbon pricing. You talk a lot of it, about it in your book uh, as one of the criticisms to the Green New Deal. You know, one of my favorite points in your book, so I should say carbon pricing is a research area of mine as well. So I, I want to dwell on this a little bit. But one of the, my, the favorite points you make is that there's somehow formed this rather strange far left and far right coalition against carbon pricing, right? right. And you know, motivated for the same reasons, but with for different reasons, but with the same outcome. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how do you think some of these you know motivations and you know potentially misconceptions formed, and what are the hurdles to overcoming them um, if we are to use this tool in the toolbox? You know, I do talk about that in the book. I, you know, I've said before that one of the, you know, sort of it's um, uh, borrowing from a line from uh, one of my favorite movies, um, uh, The Usual Suspects. Uh, you know, the, the greatest trick that the ever the devil ever pulled was convincing uh, environmental progressives to be against cl uh, carbon pricing, because um, it really has been an intentional effort by the inactivists. Um, by those on the right to actually divide environmental progressives on climate action by convincing at least some subset of them that carbon pricing, you know, is not consistent with environmental justice and climate justice. There's been an intentional campaign, and I document that in the book. You can see where conservative institutions and petrostates um, like Russia that have meddled in international politics, the uh, yellow um, vest protest in, in France that was a protest against carbon pricing, a carbon tax, um, was uh, fundamentally instigated by trolls online, which appeared to be connected to Russia. Uh, Russia's uh, done similar things in Canada and Australia. Um, one thing that you have to understand in terms of sort of the global politics here is that Russia sees its greatest asset as the, as the fossil fuels. Um, that it uh, currently has beneath its ground um, and, and, and that it hopes to monetize. And so under Putin, uh, Russia has um, played uh, an adversarial role um, trying to prevent meaningful climate action at the global scale and, and in, in, indeed um, interfering uh, with um, individual countries in their efforts to, um, you know, to, to impose uh, carbon pricing like Canada, like Australia, like the United States, um, and in, even in individual states like Washington that were considering it. <clears throat> and so what they've done is try to convince progressives that it's inconsistent, as I said before, with um, social justice and climate justice. And that doesn't have to be true. Um, where it's been implemented, like I said before, in uh, Canada, uh, in Australia, it's actually been implemented in a progressive way. And so that's really important. I think there's also this notion uh, among some uh, that 
you know, carbon pricing, you know, it's a market mechanism and it buys into neoliberal economics. It buys into market economics. And if you believe that, you know, market economics and capitalism are the villain, then, then carbon pricing therefore um, is, is unacceptable because it, it, it buys into that framing. But the point I make in the book um, is that we can have a conversation about ultimately whether we need to move towards some other system, you know, towards a global economy that isn't built on, you know, monetizing and extracting resources because there are finite resources on the planet. Eventually we come into conflict with basic planetary boundaries. Um, so we have to have that larger conversation and we probably do need to move away from an extraction, you know, resource driven global economy with, uh, you know, perpetual growth. Um, but we have to solve the climate crisis now. We've got to bring carbon emissions down by 50% within the decade. And we're not going to remake uh, the global uh, politics um, you know, uh, within that time frame. So we need to use the tools that are available to us now. And that's my argument. And carbon pricing is an important tool. The renewable portfolio standard um, is, is, is a good tool as well. Subsidies for renewable energy, are good tools. These are sort of um, demand side measures, uh, mostly. Uh, they're also supply side measures, like we should be blocking new fossil fuel infrastructure. No, you know, less, um, you know, con conservative an institution than the uh, International um, Energy Agency, uh, which has, you know, by no means been enthusiastic about renewable energy. They've generally been very bullish on, on fossil fuel energy, but even they came out with a statement just months ago saying that if we are to hold planetary temperatures below dangerous levels, there can be new, no new fossil fuel extraction. Um, so that's an important part of it as well. And global activism, as I described in the book, has played a really important role. Um, the pipeline protests, um, grassroots opposition, um, the youth climate movement, all of these things have made a real difference. So that's all really important. But let's also recognize that we have to make use of market mechanisms at the same time. Thanks for that. Um, you know, I want to touch on something you just said in terms of, you know, this confluence between climate policy and social policy. And, you know, the, the environmental movement uh, has, with the rest of the country, with, with for a number of reasons, been leaning into the social justice movement um, beyond, I think, the environmental justice movement with which it's been deeply tied for many decades. So what are your thoughts on this? You know, in, is this the right approach on climate policy in the near long term? And then, you know, in what ways might this be beneficial? And are there any pitfalls to be mindful of? Yeah, there are always pitfalls, you know, anytime you're dealing with politics and when you're up against the best funded, most powerful foe, you know, in the history of civilization, which is the fossil fuel industry, um, there are always pitfalls because they are going to use every, you know, tool in their toolbox. Um, as I describe, every tactic that they can, division, deflection, even doom mongering. Um, as I describe in the book, if they can convince us it's too late to do anything, that potentially leads us down a path of, of disengagement. So we have to look out for that as well. Um, you know, trolls trying to convince us that it's too late um, and leading some climate advocates um, to, you know, uh, into despair and disengagement and, and putting them on the front, the sidelines when they need to be on the front lines advocating for change. So all of these tactics, all these divisive tactics, um, again, they're insidious um, and um, they're uh, and they're expertly deployed by the 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 you know forces of inaction. We have to look out for them. We have to realize when they're trying to divide us. Um, and you know, here we do need to be receptive to you know different sort of points of view. Uh, you know, protests, grass, you know. Uh, Grassroots movements have played a really important role here, as I said before. Um, I actually think that you know the Biden administration sort of sidelining the Keystone XL pipeline and, and trying to prevent, uh, of course, the conservative co courts have opposed them, and that's a problem, but the Biden administration has tried to prevent uh, new pipeline construction on public lands. And part of that comes from the fact that there were a whole lot of uh, environmental activists that played a really important role in the election um, and were part of the reason that um, Joe Biden 
became president. And I think the Biden administration recognizes that, um, that they, you know, respects the fact that, um, that there is this activism, um, the Green New Deal, AOC, um, you know, that, that whole sort of wing of the party has played a really important role here. We should respect that and embrace that. At the same time, we have to also recognize that, you know, there are places where we're gonna need to meet in the middle you know, with moderates and, you know, carbon pricing may be one of them. Um, there are some compromises that are likely going to have to be made in the real world if we're going to get legislation through the Congress. And so I think we have to respect the contributions of environmental progressives. Um, and at the same time, try to reach out, you know, we're not going to win over um, most of the you know, Republican Party right now because they've sort of been weaponized um, for Donald Trump and, 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 and a right wing agenda that is just um, you know, fundamentally inconsistent with any progress on issues like climate. Um, but there are you know, moderates who actually feel alienated by what you know, the Republican Party has become. And we're going to need to bring them on board, in, in my view, if we're going to see meaningful climate legislation, um, not just this reconciliation package, but other legislation that will build on it because we will need to build on it if we're going to meet our commitments. So yeah, we, we have to be a big tent here. The climate movement has to be a big tent and we have to be receptive to moderates uh, as well as progressives and find common ground. And at the same time, not allow the forces of inaction to weaponize um, divisions within the movement um, and create wedges that once again, you know, serve a divide and conquer uh, tactic on their part to defeat climate action. Great, thank you. We're getting some good questions coming in and I, I want, and one of them is actually kind of a clarifying question. This is a good one for our audience. Can you define for our audience what we mean by carbon pricing? Yeah, so carbon pricing um, can actually be done in, in a few different ways. There is cap and trade where there's certain number of permits for, you know, uh, polluters. You can, you know, each, you know, company, each, uh, you know, corporation gets a certain number of permits of how much carbon they uh, can produce. And those permits, you know, the number of permits uh, are designed to keep carbon emissions below certain targets and they can be bought and sold. And so it's a market mechanism um, and it is putting a price on carbon, but it's doing it in a particular way. That is, um, and, and it, it's at the, the sort of point of, of production. Um, whereas say, uh, you know, carbon tax is on end use, um, carbon tax, uh, gasoline, uh, wherever CO2 you know, fossil fuels are burned and CO2 is produced, there's a, you know, a, a cost that's imposed on that. Uh, and that is um, charged to the producer. You know, they can try to pass on, along to consumers. And so it can potentially raise uh, prices. And again, that's where we need to be sure that in the end, it doesn't end up being a net tax on you know that because it doesn't become regressive and and a, a pure gasoline tax could easily become a regressive tax. Um, it could fall inordinately uh, among you know the poor and the working class. Um, so that's how you bring the revenue in. But that revenue, for example, can be returned um, to you know taxpayers and it can be returned to them on a progressive basis. So low income uh, you know families. And, uh, and, and earners uh, get more back um, from uh, more of that revenue. Uh, so there are different mechanisms for putting a price on carbon, but in the end, what you're trying to do is to take into account that there's damage that's done when we burn fossil fuels, and we need to incorporate that damage as a price signal so that renewable energy that isn't doing that same damage at least has a level playing field. Because if there's a level playing field, if it costs no more to get your electricity from wind and solar than it does from oil and gas and coal, then I think people are gonna make the right decision. Um, they're going to you know, choose the clean energy sources, but they shouldn't have to pay extra for that. Right now you do, and, and we choose to, we pay extra. We have a, an energy plan that uh, comes, in, you know, our, our energy comes entirely from wind um, generated here in the state of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, we've got a plug-in hybrid. So we, we charge up that car on wind. And so we're, you know, the more we electrify and the more, uh, you know, we can electrify the transportation sector and decarbonize electricity generation, then we're, we're decreasing our carbon emissions and the power that we use in the car that we drive. So a carbon price is simply a way, it's a market signal. It's a way of basically putting a price on pollution that's damaging the planet and, and making sure that that price signal is incorporated in the cost benefit analysis that we do as consumers. Because given a level playing field, I mean, renewable energy is already out competing fossil fuel energy right now. The only reason fossil fuel energy is still in the game is because we have politicians who are providing subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, which is exactly the opposite of what we need to do. They're, they're putting their thumb on the wrong side of the scale. We need to get rid of those subsidies. We need then to level the playing field. Carbon pricing is one way to do that because people will make the right decision um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's put to them fairly. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, I wanna go back to this uh, idea of doomism, right? You talk about making this big tent at the same time as you've been very critical of communicators who you think are really sort of sending a message of alarm uh, and doomism. Um, some prominent examples that I think uh, people in our audience would, would be familiar with are like the deep adaptation concepts or uh, the best-selling book, Uninhabitable Earth, right. um, which focused on extreme scenarios, right? right? For the purposes of sounding the alarm. But you say that you think it has the opposite effect. Can you, can you elaborate on that? I, I think it can. Um, and so we have to sort of walk carefully this line between urgency and agency, as I like to say. The urgency, it is dire. We do have to act now. But the agency, we can still act. It's not too late. And some of these narratives, frankly, portray an unsolvable uh, problem. Uh, they uh, describe climate change. Um, you know, deep adaptation has as its premise sort of runaway met the idea that there are methane feedbacks in the Arctic. And in most of these doomist narratives can actually be traced back to bad science. And this is why I criticize them from a scientific standpoint. Mm -hmm. Just as I criticize climate change deniers for being anti-scientific and for rejecting science in service of an agenda of climate inaction, I also take to task those who misrepresent the science in favor of an agenda of, you know, of, of doomism. Of in, uh, again, a, an agenda of inaction, the idea that it's too late to do anything. Um, there's one individual, Guy McPherson, who has said that runaway warming has begun. We can't do anything about it. We'll all be extinct within 10 years uh, because of runaway methane releases from the Arctic. There isn't any evidence for that. Methane is rising along with CO2, and we can actually, um, we can actually look at where it's coming from by looking at the isotopes of carbon and the methane that's burning, uh, that's building up in the atmosphere. And we know it's coming primarily from livestock and agriculture and natural gas extraction, fracking in particular, um, fugitive methane emissions when we drill for natural gas. Um, so that's where it's coming from. And so it's not coming from a runaway feedback that we can't stop. The methane rise in the atmosphere is coming from fossil fuel extraction, and it's something we can do something about. And what you see at the sort of the base of all of these doomist narratives is this wrongful, you know, you know, erroneous argument that there's evidence for runaway methane warming feedbacks that's unstoppable, that'll lead to runaway warming, and there's nothing we can do about it. And to the extent that that sort of misrepresentation of the science is used to portray, you know, again, um, in service of a narrative of futility, <clears throat> and, um, you know, that's, it, it's wrong on the science, and it's unhelpful at the same time, because it leads you know, to disengagement. Now we have to distinguish between doomism and sort of alarm. There's reason for alarm. We should be alarmed by what we're seeing. Alarm alone isn't doomism. Doomism is it's so bad that it's really too late to do anything about it. And deep adaptation is this idea. Um, this is one of the things that fossil fuel interests have tried to do, have tried to convince us <clears throat> that um, adaptation 
is the only way we can deal with climate change because it takes the pressure off of mitigation, reducing our carbon emissions. They do, oh, we just have to adapt to these changes. It's a, a, another way of deflecting attention away from the systemic changes that need to take place. Um, we, we do need to adapt to those changes that are already baked in, no question about it. But this idea that we should build future adaptation into a scenario of future warming that is preventable ends up deflecting attention from the needed action, from the needed mitigation. And deep adaptation takes that to an extreme. It says it's too late to stop it. Basically, we should all just live off the grid, move up north, enjoy life while we still can because there's nothing we can do to prevent a catastrophic collapse of our climate and civilization. It's just wrong on the science and it's wrong on the messaging. And so I do call it out at the same time, really important to recognize that a lot of the people that we know, friends, family members, we, people who've fallen for that sort of doomism, they're victims. They're not villains. They're victims of this framing. Uh, and to the extent that they've come to believe it, it's too late, we need to help them to understand that it isn't. We need to get them off the sidelines and back on the front lines. Yeah, no, that's a really important message. I, I recently had somebody email me about, you know, why do you spend your time working on greenhouse gas mitigation? This is a total waste of time. And so person who I, I usually like to listen to their emails, yeah. uh, and it was you know, total waste of time. Uh, spend your time doing something else. And once we went back and forth a little bit, it was clear that he had signed into onto the sort of deep adaptation yeah. uh, readings. So no, very it's, interesting. It's really, it's pernicious. It really is pernicious. Um, and, you know, I think it's done more damage to climate action than much of the outright denialism. You know why? Because the people who are targeted are the people who would otherwise be most likely to be on the front lines. Uh, but you lead them down this path of disengagement. You know, the right has already very successfully, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry and the, the inactivists have already very successfully fuel marshaled the political right for their cause. How tragic if they would also be successful in marshaling at least a significant fraction of the political left for their cause as well. This next question coming in from the audience, uh, follow, you know, you use the word front lines, uh, you know, we, and we hear that a lot, the front lines of climate change, but also very more recently, um, the front lines of the pandemic, right? It's a right. concept here a lot. And, you know, why do you choose to engage sort of the war analogy per se is this question? Um, you know, I'm thinking of the war on drugs, which didn't actually turn out to be a particularly useful framing. So what makes this a war in your mind, or at least the war analogy a strong one? Yeah, and um, I, I didn't come up with that analogy, but I've um, but I've embraced it here, uh, and and I try to make very clear in the book that look, this isn't a war of our choosing, but you do have to recognize when you're in a war with bad actors um, uh, who have uh, malevolent intentions. Um, you know, woe to the country or the constituency that is under attack and refuses to recognize it. So we have to recognize that there has been this bad faith effort by the fossil fuel industry and those advocating for them. And you know, tens of billions of dollars spent in a massive disinformation campaign aimed at preventing climate action. It's what the tobacco industry did to prevent you know, any action on tobacco. It's what we actually saw the Trump administration try to do with the pandemic because they saw, you know, social distancing as a threat to their reelection prospects. And so COVID denial became sort of part of the ideology of Trumpism. And we saw that sort of anti-science weaponized um, and, and, and people died, hundreds of thousands of Americans, it's fair to say, unnecessarily died because of that bad faith assault on basic public health policies that, that would have saved those lives. Um, so we may not like the idea of war, but it isn't a war of our choosing, but we are under assault by bad actors. We have to recognize that. The easiest way to lose a war, as I say in the book, is to refuse to recognize that you're in one in the first place. So we have to recognize that there are bad actors there, but we also have to recognize that there are positive narratives here that are really important too. Um, we can build a better future uh, for us, our children and grandchildren, 
um, we can, you know, uh, create a world um, where, you know, there's opportunity and there are jobs um, and, you know, we preserve the environment at the same time. So while there are negative narratives out there that at times are important to, to understand, and, and it, there are positive narratives there as well. And that's, you know, where, again, I try to contrast the doomism that is uh, widespread uh, among some with the cautious optimism that is actually justified. Um, if you understand what the science has to say and you understand where we are in this moment right now with a youth climate movement that's reawakened global activism on this issue, uh, where we have a monumental opportunity in Glasgow, um, you know, just next month um, for the countries of the world to come together and to make the commitments that will keep warming below dangerous levels. It can be done. There are no technological obstacles here. Um, the only obstacles are, are political will. And so, yes, again, there are negative narratives that are relevant to the bad faith assault um, that we have faced, but it's equally important to talk about uh, hope and opportunity as well, positive narratives that can help gu guide us in the right direction. Thanks for that. Um, there are so many good questions coming in. I'm going to try, we only I'll have- I'll try to be more rapid than in my uh, responses. Yeah. Uh, in our last uh, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, so a similar kind of framing question and also kind of arising from the youth climate movement you just mentioned. Um, could you share some of your thoughts about the framing of, and the policy value of a climate emergency declaration? Is it useful? How is it useful? And for context, uh, our state legislature by resolution declared a climate emergency last session. Yeah, I, I think a climate emergency is sort of uh, appropriate framing. I mean, it is an emergency. How can you have watched what played out this summer um, here in the United States and, and, and around you know, the entire Northern hemisphere this summer or what happened down in the Southern hemisphere when I was there on the sabbatical? We are in emergency, we're seeing damaging, dangerous, unprecedented climate change impacts now. So, you know, I do advise against crossing that line in our language from like urgency and emergency is urgency, right? It's the ultimate urgency. We just can't cross that line into lack of agency, uh, doomism, despair, hopelessness, uh, because, you know, again, uh, Urgency without agency does not provide a path forward. Thanks. I want to, in our last few minutes, sort of dive into Hawaii specific issues and then jump up to the global and talk a little bit about uh, COP26. Um, you know, so we talked about Hawaii has a, an ambitious renewable portfolio standard and also in the sort of pushback to the Trump administration saying, uh, that it would pull out of the Paris Agreement. Hawaii was among the states that joined the U.S. Climate Alliance um, and, you know, had the We Are Still in Paris movement, which resulted in legislation in 2018 to become carbon net negative, the language as soon as practicable and no later than 2045. Yeah, and so, I happen to know your, your junior senator, Brian Schatz, and he's just okay. wonderful. He has been so good on, on, on this issue. Um, yes. Hawaii is well represented here. Definitely. He's been a very important leader on the climate issue. So that's great. For our audience, just because I know this idea of carbon net negative is a, is a little wonky, what the idea is that you would annually absorb or sequester more carbon than you emit, right? And carbon, including all greenhouse gases. Um, so we have these ambitious targets on the books. And in some ways, the you know, we have some clear roadmaps for you know the RPS and the electricity sector. And then there's a lot of ways where I think the roadmap isn't clear at all, right? Um, what advice do you have for Hawaii states in general that really want to make good on climate action um, and have been sort of waiting for federal leadership and trying to do their own thing at the same time? What do you, what do you say to us? Well, yeah, you know, again, so, you know, your two senators, I mean, it's important <clears throat> for be, look for, to, to continue lobbying uh, for you know, for, for federal, uh, you know, climate action. There's no question about it. But in the meantime, you know, until we have that, there is so much that we can do at, at the, the state level. And, and Hawaii has provided a great example, along with California, 
Um, you know, during some of the darker times when the Trump administration withdrew from the, the Paris Accord, when we had a president who was literally a climate change denier, um, dismissed it as a Chinese hoax, we had politicians in California, my friend Jerry Brown, and, and now Gavin Newsom, who took leadership positions, um, and Hawaii and other states uh, that, that, that took le leadership. And because of that, because of what states were doing, because of what municipalities were doing, and in fact, some of our larger companies that made real commitments to the, we are still in, you know, uh, Paris, uh, sort of, um, uh, the, 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 we are still in movement um, when, when the Trump administration uh, threatened to pull out of Paris. Because of what was happening at, at all of those levels, the local level, at the state level, consortia of states like the West Coast states and the New England and Mid-Atlantic states, um, we pretty much met our Paris obligations. So that's the good news. We, we met, you know, uh, our commitments um, that were made, you know, by Barack Obama back uh, during, uh, you know, the latter part of that administration. That's the good news. The bad news is Paris doesn't get us anywhere close to what we need. Um, it, the Paris commitments alone would lead us to, you know, three, four degrees Celsius warming, you know, down the road potentially. So we need much more. We need to go well beyond Paris. And that's really what Glasgow is about in these commitments going into Glasgow by various countries to basically bring carbon emissions down by roughly 50%. Uh, well, I should say there's a lot of talk about bringing carbon emissions to <clears throat> net zero by 2050. And as you say, net negative beyond because eventually we actually have to bring CO2 levels back down if we're going to cool the planet. There's reason to believe that even if we keep the planet elevated at this temperature for centuries, we may lose very large parts of um, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, enough to flood large parts of you know, the coast of uh, Hawaii um, and, and, and other coastal locations and low-lying island nations around the world. So we may need to go net negative uh, ultimately, but but the first step um, is to begin bringing them down. We've got to come down this slope. We're at the peak right now. And there's some evidence, if you look at carbon emissions over the past few years, and sort of have to iron out you know, the effects of COVID-19. There was a big dip, but then that sort of came back. But if you sort of stand back and look at the larger trend, we're sort of at that peak starting to come down. The problem is we've got to be down half the way to zero by 2030. And a lot of the commitments we're hearing right now from countries like Australia, for example, uh, from Russia, for example, they're happy to talk about 2050 or 2060 um, and being carbon you know, neutral by then. And that's all fine, but we've got to bring carbon emissions down by 50% by 2030. And that means action now. It means we can't kick the, the can down the road. And too many policymakers are trying to do that by focusing on this distant commitment and not focusing on what needs to be done for these nearer term reductions. And there is what's known as a implementation gap, which is, for example, if you look at the United States and the UK and the EU, um, all have commitments to bring carbon emissions down basically by 50%, you know, within the decade, which is great. But the action on the ground doesn't support that. We're still seeing pipeline construction here in the United States. We're still seeing it in the UK. In the IEA, as we said before, even the Conservative International Energy Agency has said there could be no new infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure, if we're to keep carbon uh, levels below those dangerous levels. So there is this implementation gap. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. And it comes back to grassroots pressure. It really does make a difference. The, the youth climate protests, the, the climate justice movement, all of these things have brought tremendous pressure to bear, and has de and, and which has certainly brought along the, the Biden administration. But we can't let up on that pressure. We still have two intransigent Democrats um, who stand, who are in a position to block meaningful climate action. We have to use every means at our disposal to make it politically impossible for them to do that. I think that is the note we want to end on. We are at time and that was kind of the perfect finish. And I just, for our audience, you know, really tune into the COP negotiations, get involved in climate activism. Um, there are so many things that we can individually and collectively push for um, moving forward. And I really want to thank you, Mike, for this conversation. I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, thanks for being here. Mahalo. And
it's been my pleasure. Mahalo. Nice. And also in closing, I just wanted to thank the Better Tomorrow series staff, the Hawaii Book and Music Festival for putting together this event. Um, a special thanks to Robert Perkinson and Roger Jelinek for spearheading this um, and to all of the audience for tuning in. Much appreciated. Thanks for all of your great questions and comments coming in. Aloha. Thank you.